Ok, buenos días, ¿cómo estamos? Voy a presentar en inglés porque el español ya me falta un poco, muchos años viviendo en Canadá. Um, ok, so, uh, thanks everybody for the opportunity to be here. Uh, obviously I'm here because I support a lot of what Miriam is trying to do by connecting Latin America to, uh, to Canada and to really North America and the world and uh, I see a lot of opportunity in it and I guess that's really what I'm here to present about. So, um, you know, I can only say that uh, thank you for coming, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to uh, join us today. Okay, so to get started, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is really our, our journey, kind of what we've been doing, where we've come from, where we are today as an organization, uh, who we serve, uh, why we serve them, and uh, what impact we think we can have together uh, by joining together in, uh, in, in this kind of collaborative form. And that's really kind of the arc of my presentation. I'm going to try to do it so that I leave some time for questions afterwards. And, uh, and so, you know, hopefully we get to that and uh, you'll have some questions for me. Uh, I'm going to stand right here so you can get a nice uh, Latin startup logo next to me. Is that good? All right, cool. <laughs> uh, okay, so to get started. Uh, I think that's working. There we go, okay. So about the National Angel Capital Organization. First of all, let me just say that I realize our acronym is NACO, okay, or NACO, okay, yes, I know. But in Canada, they don't understand what that means, okay. <laughs> me being Latin America, and I understand. Being in Mexico, I am extremely sensitive to that. But uh, nonetheless, you know, I like to take the approach and say that our members and, and their startups are becoming richer. And so they're nouveau riche, and so therefore maybe they're a little bit naco. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, our organization is uh, really the industry association in Canada for the angel investor community, and uh, and so we kind of are the organization that sits on top of the rest of the angel networks in Canada. We have uh, been building a network, but really we started pretty humble beginnings. We've been around 15 plus years now. I think legally we've been around 15 years. We've probably been around closer to 20 now. And, uh, and it all really started with 100 super angels, big check writers that were very active in the community before really angel investment was a big hot buzzword. Um, and they got together because they realized that they were losing a lot of that money that they were writing. And I'm sure for anybody who's made investments in this room, you probably are, can sympathize with that experience. Um, they, they were not really getting the kind of outcomes that they wanted from their investments. They realized that a lot of the mistakes they were making were simple mistakes. Not only that, they were making the same mistakes over and over again and without the benefit of learning from each other. So they really got together to form this organization uh, about 15 years ago as a way to uh, share ideas, share best practices, and hopefully uh, talk each other into some good deals, talk each other out of maybe a few bad ones as well. Um, and that's really where we started. But today, um, we're a bigger organization now. So, um, you know, I've been with the organization about four years now, and in that time, we've tried to grow it into more of a broad-based community association in Canada and uh, representing really angel investment, but I would say even risk capital, early stage risk capital for startups. Uh, we have a number of members. Uh, in fact, we have 3,000 angel investors across Canada that are members of our organization. Um, many of them are associated with uh, one of the 41 networks that are member organizations of our, net, our uh, organization. Um, and, and really what they do is uh, act as a local champion locally uh, in their communities in order to kind of corral and, and build the relationships between the angel investors on a day-to-day -day basis. What we do is kind of sit above that and try to play a more supportive role for those organizations. But, uh, you know, this is kind of, uh, as of 2015, kind of the breakout of our organization. We've been growing a lot in Western Canada. Uh, we're, we're starting to grow more in Eastern Canada. And um, so, you know, we've had a, a good bit of success there. Our mission as an organization is really to grow and develop angel investment as an asset class uh, in Canada. Um, and, and, you know, we really think this is critical to funding uh, innovation, to funding the startups and the entrepreneurs that will create the innovations, and to make sure that uh, that asset class is sustainable. Because I think anybody who's kind of known an angel investor that has written a lot of checks will sympathize with the fact that once they've written a few of those checks and they don't see the money coming back, they just stop writing checks. And that's not sustainable. 
So we need to create an ecosystem. We're, we firmly believe that we need to create an ecosystem that is going to be sustainable, that is going to generate uh, success in the companies, that th that success is going to generate returns for the investors, and that through those returns, it will create almost like an evergreen system of investment going back and forth, investing in new companies and new entrepreneurs, having new exited entrepreneurs become investors and, and start investing themselves. And that's really what we're trying to create is, is more of a, a really a movement or a, a cultural paradigm shift in Canada. Um, and, you know, while I will say that I've traveled around Latin America a lot, and I think, you know, um, the, we're slightly ahead, I would say, of Latin America in terms of our development, we're still nowhere near uh, Silicon Valley. We're still a fairly new ecosystem, and so we're still learning. But so how do we do, how do we accomplish this? How do we actually try to build this sustainable angel investment ecosystem? Well, we do it in three ways. One is empowering connections. The other one is improving outcomes. And the third is becoming a voice for the angel investment community. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about these in more detail now. Uh, as an empowering connector, what we really do is try to connect together uh, the ecosystem uh, of investors and also of the partners. Um, so, you know, the number one goal here is membership growth. So this is just for your sake, uh, how our membership has been growing over the last four years since I've been able to kind of keep statistics on this. Um, so this is the important goal because you need more angel investors to make more deals to create more of a momentum. Um, but again, it's kind of a, if, if you're doing it right, it's kind of a, a snowball effect where essentially every year more angels beget more angels beget more angels. And so that's really been the secret to our success is creating that sense of community like uh, Abdullah was talking about earlier. We then connect the ecosystem together because really, um, you know, you can maybe, what we've seen in our data is that, you know, maybe an individual angel investor in Canada will make uh, an investment of between 25000 or 150, maybe $200,000 in a single investment. Um, the average probably sitting around $50,000. Uh, but as a network, as a community, as an angel group, uh, we've seen the average deal go to about 250 to 350,000, and that's pretty good for an angel stage deal, even in Canada. But we've taken that one step further, and actually, by getting our members to collaborate with each other, what we've done is taken that now to the point where the average deal size now is closer to 1.2 million uh, per deal. So that means that what's happening is that you're getting multiple networks now collaborating with each other to fund companies, not just for the first check but also through various stages of development so that the companies are, are growing and able to grow to the point where strategic companies or VCs might actually be ready to come in and invest in them as well. So really trying to fill that continuum um, and, and make sure that those companies have the, have the runway to grow and that you know, the CEO's job doesn't become chief fundraising officer. Um, we also connect them to our partners. So uh, as you can see, the DMZ is, is actually front and center right there. Look at that, Abdullah. Right in the middle. Um, but anyways, uh, we have a lot of partners, uh, the government, accelerators, incubators, number of organizations across Canada that have dedicated their lives or their, their organization's lives to supporting entrepreneurs, helping them develop, helping them develop their businesses. Um, that's something that we don't do. We're very specific about that. What we do is then help connect entrepreneurs that are ready, the ones that have been vetted by our partners to our investors, and help them develop relationships so that they can actually grow those companies. Um, so we, we come in after kind of that initial stage of support. Now, improving outcomes. Um, so really, in terms of improving outcomes, we do this in three ways. Uh, it's really about research, education, and best practices. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more. So this is actually a copy. And I think I have a few if somebody wants them. Uh, but this is a copy uh, of an actual print that we do every year uh, on the report on angel investment activity in Canada. Uh, this is a report that we've been doing for six years now. We collect something like 70 data points from our member investors about the companies they've invested in and use that information in order to generate insights. This infographic is actually just the kind of top key sexy bullet points from that data, but actually the report itself is about 60 pages long and we partner with universities in order to get that data analyzed and produced uh, so that it's independent, so that it is um, you know, defendable. And, uh, and what our members do then is use that to benchmark themselves. Um, we take that one step further then and we use the insights generated from that data and we create best practices. So last year, uh, or actually this year, uh, this spring, we just launched our first ever guidebook for angel investing. And uh, so this is a, a year plus collaboration that we did with a number of our strategic partners. 
Um, and, uh, and some of the NGO investors in our community where we went around and actually started asking our members, what are the practices that you have um, that have helped you along the way that we could learn from, that everybody could learn from. And we look at things like regional diversity, uh, changes in between the stages of development, the stages of companies they're investing in. And it's really just meant to be an introductory guide for people looking at uh, becoming an angel investor or looking at sharpening their angel investment skills. This is the beginning. This is just the best practices, the, the high watermark. Then we take it to the next level. Last year in 2015, we launched the Canada's first angel investment education program where we actually created a platform of education where uh, a member that has expertise, that has built up a reputation in a specific type of uh, or process of the deal flow, uh, we actually get them to develop half-day workshops that are in-person based on case studies uh, to go and actually educate other members. And we use this as a way of engaging our members, of giving them more comfort to become more active as angel investors to hopefully generate better returns, um, but also as a way of recruiting new angel investors, people that are thinking of becoming angel investors but actually haven't become super active. Um, and so, you know, the, just for your sake, um, the ones in dark blue are the ones that are on our pipeline. So we, we took six months to plan out the pipeline through interviews with the membership in terms of what things they wanted to learn about. So the, the dark blue is our pipeline, the light blue is the workshops that we've already created. And in fact, we've already delivered, just in the last year alone, 21 workshops across the country through doing this. So this is something that we're really proud of. And um, it's in English, but uh, you know, if, uh, if anybody's interested, we have actually already started uh, partnering with ecosystems in other places like the Caribbean to deliver this education in kind of new and emerging ecosystems as well. Now, and then, of course, the last point that I made at the beginning was that we're a voice for angels. And really what that means is that we try to help our members um, have, have, tell their stories. We try to help uh, the community uh, learn about what they're doing, about their companies, about the successes that they've had. We think that this is the kind of critical key point to creating a culture of risk-taking and entrepreneurship in Canada. You have to kind of create this momentum. And, and we do that through telling their stories. Um, uh, we, we also work with the media to do this and of course we work with the government as well to inform policy based on the research, based on their membership's input uh, when needed. And so we, we, I, I'd like to say that we're seen as a, as a good and uh, reliable partner for the government right now uh, on these issues. So um, now of course, you know, this isn't really about what we've accomplished so far, but you know, what have we learned along the way? Well, here's some of the insights that I've learned that I think are kind of critical to uh, both why and how we can collaborate together as ecosystems. So first of all, angel investors, just to kind of define them for, uh, I, you know, the definition might be slightly different in Mexico or in, in certain ecosystems, like it's a little bit different based on the stage of development of the ecosystem. Uh, in Canada, this is kind of how we define angel investors. So essentially they're experienced, well-educated, uh, high net worth professionals, right? In Canada, there's actually a law that says that you can't be an angel investor unless if you make a certain amount of money that really puts you within the two percentile of the wealthiest people in the country. Um, and, uh, and that's really as an investor protection mechanism. You know, the government wants to know that you can lose the money and not, you know, not have your life ruined by losing the money. Um, so uh, the other thing is that they invest patiently with personal funds in uh, funding high risk nascent businesses. So, uh, you know, again, personal funds, it's my money, I'm making the decision. And what that does is that I don't have to respond to an LP, I don't have to respond to um, a government partner that has given me money. I can make the decisions about what to do with that investment, uh, how much time to give that company, and what ways to help that company. And through that process, I'm a lot more flexible in making sure that, that you know, I can adjust to the realities of that company as it grows. And that's kind of really important because um, if you're using somebody else's money, you're accountable to somebody else. Our angels, I always say, are, are really usually only accountable to their uh, families. <laughs> Sometimes you get a little bit of pressure that way. Um, they often work alone, uncoordinated, they lack self-awareness, um, but the important part is that they fill the gap between family and friends and government and accelerators, all the kind of early stage uh, organizations that are out there to get companies off the ground. Our members actually come in and then fill the gap between them and the venture capitalists. The venture capitalists are incredibly important, um, but they, they play, they're, they're really built as a model to play in a very specific stage of the ecosystem. And so our members are kind of critical to that. And then, um, you know, why do they invest? So uh, this is like the psychology of angel investment. And really what we've learned is that angels, primarily when we ask them, uh, we do survey them every once in a while about this. Of course, they like the financial return, but it's usually not the top 
priority. It, again, it depends on what stage in life they're in. If they're still young and trying to accumulate assets, that's going to be a very important factor for them. Whereas if they've kind of hit retirement, they've had their successes, they, they have their money they're sitting on, um, that's less of a priority for them. It's usually actually about giving back, about being able to support and mentor new entrepreneurs. Usually they were entrepreneurs themselves, which means that somebody helped them along the way, and they really have this sense of uh, nation building that they have to give back and, and support the next generation. Uh, and the other side is that they want to stay connected. If, if you were a uh, CEO or a C-level executive in the telecom industry, um, you probably retired. You doesn't mean that you just like curl up and die. You know, you, you want to still stay engaged. You're excited by what's happening in the technology space. And so this is an opportunity for you to stay engaged in what's happening and be in the cutting edge of technology without necessarily having to spend the 80 hours a week as an entrepreneur yourself. And, and so those are really the top reasons. And, and in terms of uh, the practices, again, they often invest alone, although we have seen more co-investment, partly through this collaboration and connections. Um, and now we've seen almost like a culture of lead investors emerging where people are following an investor that they trust. And now this is important because it's actually the trust that's the key part. It's really about social networks. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to help facilitate and support that culture uh, as a way to getting more capital out into, into the marketplace. Um, sometimes that's through angel groups, sometimes not, but, uh, but you know, these are all effective levers and mechanisms for them. Um, now, finally, you know, when do angels invest? Okay, so this is important. Uh, I think Abdullah kind of hit it uh, pretty well when he was talking about it. You know, they invest in the team. They invest in the entrepreneur, they invest in the people. Um, somebody that they can work with and mentor. This is probably the first go-no-go -no -go decision they make. Do I like this person? Can I live with this person, like be married to this person essentially for the next seven to ten years? Because that's often how long it takes. And, and so if, they, if the answer to that question is no, they usually don't invest. And, and then, of course, you know, beyond that, once you understand that you like the people involved in the venture, then it's about, okay, well, uh, do they have a company? Does it have measurable traction? Is there some metric, whether it's revenues, users, whatever, that we can measure that we can track, that we can show whether this company is growing or, or shrinking or succeeding or failing. And then uh, is this an industry that they have expertise in? What industry is it? Is it an industry that I'm interested in? Is it somewhere where I can add value? Uh, can I see the pathway to ROI, right? Do I know in my mind who the strategic acquirer or, cu or customer is that's going to make this company go from a million dollars in operating to a hundred million dollars in operating? And so then, uh, you know, can I help them get to that exit? Do I know the people that they need to know in order to get there? And that's kind of the key decision process often for our members. It's not usually about your idea, though, and that's really important because a lot of people get hung up on their idea. I have this great idea. It's a gazillion dollar industry. We're going to capture all of it. We're all going to be billionaires. Usually doesn't work out that way. So, um, you know, it's really about the people. And, and I'll say on that part, you know, angel investors will often invest in a company with a bad idea uh, or a team with a bad company and a bad idea just because they believe in the people so much that they're, they just want to be part of this journey and they're ready to invest in the next one. So, you know, it really isn't about the idea. Um, and then, you know, just kind of to make the point more um, uh, clear, really this is what angel investors do, right? So they, they take Canadian innovation, they add to that financial capital, which is really the dollars that they put in, they add to it intellectual capital, which is their experience, their knowledge that they've gained over the years, and they add their relationship capital, which really can be measured in the number of doors that they can open for that entrepreneur. And through that, they try to help drive innovation. So that's kind of a really critical role in the, in the process. Um, and we've actually taken the time to map this out. Um, and this is something that we've been kind of uh, talking to a lot of people about lately. But we've mapped it out based on the size of deals uh, on average that each stage of investment does based on our data, based on the data from the VC Association in Canada, which is our partner organization, and some of the government data that we have. And what you can see there is kind of this innovation valley of death that everybody, at least in, in North America, always talks about, and Canada always talks about, which is where the companies usually die. I can imagine in Mexico it's not that much different. Um, this is where angels can really play a, a critical role as individuals first, then as groups, and eventually as syndicates. And so, you know, why is it important to collaborate? Well, I mean, obviously, we've had a good amount of uh, success in Canada uh, building our ecosystem, building our, 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 our community, but there's still a lot more that can be done. And the reality is Canada is a population of 36 million people, right? We have a GDP that I think is actually less than a tenth of the U.S., right? You can't build 
hundred million dollar, billion dollar businesses solely based on the Canadian marketplace. All of our companies need to go abroad and expand into new markets in order to be able to grow to that scale. And, and, and the reality is many of your companies need to access other markets as well. And so we think there's a huge opportunity for collaboration between our networks to help each other, to actually take this to the point where it's not just about the initial rounds of investment, but then it's actually about accessing markets. We think that the investor community locally can, can be a critical anchor for a foreign company coming in, trying to expand into a market. And that's really where we're trying to focus on. You know, it, it's, it's, it's doing that, it's being able to collect the data about that and being able to generate the insights again, as we always do. And we see a tremendous amount of opportunity in collaborating with these ecosystems in that way. In fact, I've been spending my own time uh, trying to build those networks. Um, so, you know, just to give you an idea, some of the points that I already raised earlier about valuation, uh, median deal size, this is kind of what our market looks like uh, right now. This is based on last year's data. And as you can see, we have three years of data on the, on the chart there, but we have six years of data behind this. Um, and so, you know, this is really about collaboration. We want to collaborate with your investors. We, we already have a great amount of collaboration happening in Canada, which sometimes feels almost like foreign business development. Um, but we want to do more abroad. We want to do it with you. And uh, I just will mention one last note, which is that uh, last, this year, I just actually came back from my conference. And at my conference, we had, uh, it, for the first time, 16 international companies come and participate at the conference. A good many of them were actually from Latin America. And at this year's conference, we chose the number one and number two international companies that came. And the number one company was from Chile. I promise I had nothing to do with that. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm from Chile. Uh, but the number two company is actually a company from Mexico that uh, a lot of you might know. Um, can you remember the name? Betelio, yeah. A fantastic company that our members have already invested in. So our members are already making investments in Mexico. They're making investments in Chile. They're, making, they're starting to make investments in Brazil. We want to see more of that happening, and, and really that's why I'm here. So thank you very much.